Welcome everyone and thank you for joining us from across Connecticut and the country it seems. My name is Tracy Wu Fastenberg, pronouns she, her, and I'm a member of the West Hartford Parent Community Edu Equity, Diversity and Inclusion Groups. Tonight's event is intended to provide factual, scientific information from medical experts, as well as personal insights from a respected member of the LGBTQIA community. As caregivers, it is our responsibility to educate ourselves to ensure that our community is inclusive and supportive to our gender diverse youth, whether they are our own children or their peers, our students or our neighbors, particularly if we ourselves identify as cisgender. Um, no matter how much we think we know, we always have more to learn and unpack. I wanna thank our partners for the amazing work they're doing each day, West Hartford Human Rights Commission, West Hartford Pride, West Hartford Community of Concern, Hartford Gay and Lesbian Health Collective, and our host this evening, West Hartford Community Interactive. I also wanna thank the members of the trans, non-binary and gender diverse communities who spent time sharing their thoughts and input as we plan this event. And thank you to everyone who helped share this with others as well. Our medical experts this evening are Dr. Priya Fulwani, MD, pediatric endocrinologist at Connecticut Children's, where she is also the medical director of the gender program and co-medical director of the Clinic for Variations in Sex Development, and an adult endocrinologist at Hartford HealthCare. Dr. Christopher Hughes, MD and master's in public health, is a surgeon at Connecticut Children's in craniofacial and plastic surgery, where he is also involved in the global healthcare program. He is a surgeon in reconstructive and plastic surgery at Hartford HealthCare as well. Don Ennis, our facilitator, is an award-winning journalist, journalist, advocate, and parent. She serves as co-chair of the West Hartford Human Rights Commission and is professor of journalism at University of Hartford and faculty member at the School of Communications and the University Interdisciplinary Studies. This event is a continuation of past conversations on gender and it is our intention to provide a continuum of learning with a future event dedicated to gender diversity and mental health. We also invite you to join us for our other initiatives supporting caregivers and children around equity, diversity, and inclusion. And without any more from me, I will turn this over to Dawn um, so I can enjoy the learning as well. Thank you all. Thank you, Tracy. I'm so thrilled that you decided to join us for this. Let me just start by saying something personal. I knew when I was four years old that I was not a boy. And I told my mother this. My mother said, no, you're not a girl. You're just special. This was 1965, uh, 60, 69. I was told there'd be no math, but it was 1969. And you know what? I guess in a way I was special because I was pretending to be a boy for so many years. and. Unfortunately, I didn't get to live my truth because that kind of thing didn't exist back then. It took until I was 49 years old that I finally found the courage to come out and live my true life. And now as a parent, a single parent of three wonderful children, I'm now going through a process that many of you may be thinking about or going through yourself. One of my three children came out last month as gender fluid trans femme. It's a journey and I'm learning many things. I hope to learn tonight as well. I think that there'll be questions for the doctors and if you have questions for me, I'll be happy to answer them. But mostly I'm here to make sure that we get answers to all these questions we have. So let me start please with Dr. Priya Fulwani. Doctor, would you please tell us a little bit about what you do at Children's Connecticut Children's Medical Center? Yeah, sure. So I'm the medical director of our gender program there. Um, and so I help diverse youth, gender diverse youth with understanding and going through their journey. When they're coming through my door though, Dawn, they've already gone through a process where they've come to these realizations for the most part. Um, and I highly encourage that they have connected with a therapist and have mental support along their journey and to make sure they understand what their goals are. Because as an endocrinologist, my role is more on the hormonal aspects of it and how I can support them with those options. So today I wanna to talk a little bit about understanding these um, different identities um, and going into what the medical options would be when they come across through my door. I'm also the um, medical director in a clinic for variations in sex development. And I'll 
touch upon how that piece is different from gender identity diversity. Um, and then I'm also an adult endocrinologist in a long, you know, alongside my PD uh, endo role. So I wear many hats and it is my extreme pleasure um, to speak on the subject always and especially today uh, with this forum, thanks. All right, so if we can advance that first slide, that would be great. Thank you. So my objectives today are that we gain at the end an understanding of gender identity versus sexual orientation. I apologize if some of this to some of you is very basic, but I'd like to just review that briefly, the terminology. Also gender dysphoria in children and adolescents, and then the medical options piece and when they might be appropriate. Thanks. Next slide. So um, the first objective is really more about terminology. So when we say LGBTQIA+, which of these things refer more to orientation and identity and what do those terms even mean? Next slide, please. Okay. So orientation is a concept which speaks to, to whom we are attracted. It's to whom, the outside, whom we are attracted to. So we're kind of familiar with terms like heterosexual or homosexual. Um, when we talk about LGB, that's the lesbian, gay, bisexual would be in that orientation term. There are also other terms that are increasingly being used, including pansexual or asexual. To some people, the A in that bracket of uh, verbiage stands for asexual, to some people it stands for agender, so that A sort of crosses both orientation and identity. Next slide, please. Expression is how one presents. So that could be your physical appearance, your clothing, your mannerisms. It's important to realize that someone's expression may or may not conform to their internal gender identity. And I mention that because there may be many reasons why that's not the case. Safety is often an issue, loss of friends at school, fear of stigma. There may be many reasons why someone is not comfortable with their expression meeting their within identity. Next slide, please. So when we say LGBTQIA, what's that I piece stand for? So I stands for intersex and individuals that have variations in their sex development in their biology may refer, may choose to refer to themselves as being intersex. As a clinician, when I'm seeing someone with this condition in my other clinic, I would write the diagnosis as the actual medical diagnosis, but certainly the patient may say to me that I identify as intersex. And these may be variations in reproductive organs, whether they're externally visible or our internal parts, hormones, chromosomes, basically that are not fitting into the typical um, concepts of what is considered male or female. So there are actually chromosomal variations. When we're taught high school biology, oftentimes we're thinking of things in the binary. So there's XX and XY, and if you're XX, you're female, and if XY is male. But the reality is actually there are variations along that spectrum. There are syndromes where you may have a single X. There are syndromes where you may have two Xs and a Y. There are conditions where the chromosomes, in fact, are in the XX or XY realm, but the hormonal milieu, you may have excess masculinization of someone born that's XX. You may have someone born XY that has under masculinization from what is typically expected. And so there are several of these conditions that fall into the biology, into that I category. Next slide, please. The genderbred person is this sort of free tool that explains this a little bit better. So one's gender identity is what one feels knows themselves to be within. So your identity is who you know yourself to be. And one of the questions I get asked is, well, you know, why is it that someone knows at this age and someone knows at that age? Studies show that most people have a sense of this around age four to six when gender identity first forms. What that first realization is, oh, so-and-so is a boy and so-and-so is a girl. So that realization often, but importantly, not always starts at that age. A lot of times there might be a feeling or a realization briefly, but it's, it's allowed to express in older age groups. Oftentimes puberty sometimes is when it's expressed. So there's a spectrum to when that gender identity, knowing your gender within yourself, comes to being. But identity, 
who you are within yourself is different from your attractions or orientation is different sometimes from your expression, how you're carrying yourself. And that's a different concept from biology or biological sex. And so sometimes I, I have a, a young person who will discuss this with me and say, you know, I'm struggling with how to explain how that's different to grandma or to cousin or to a friend. And I suggest, you know, why don't you show them this tool? And maybe that'll help you explain how these concepts are separate. Next slide, please. And so that gender identity, when it's differing from that that it was assigned at birth, it can then lead to dysphoria. So I want to speak a little bit about what is gender dysphoria, specifically as that pertains to children and adolescents. Speak a little bit about prevalence of this, how the diagnosis is made, persistence, because that's often asked, and some mental health data for this age group. Next slide, please. Okay. So gender incongruence, right, incongruent, is the persistent, insistent, and consistent, and hence not a phase, realization that the gender one identifies with, often also called the affirmed gender, is other than the gender at birth. One of the most common questions I get asked in my clinic is, how do I know? that this is not a phase. And again, it's that persistent, insistent, consistent nature of that realization. This can then, this incongruence can then lead to dysphoria, to sadness. And that term is called gender dysphoria. This may or may not correlate, super important, may or may not correlate with the desire to then proceed any further, such as with hormones or surgeries. Some people are comfortable with social transition and they pause there. Some people go on to want other steps. I've had more than one patient share with me that people have assumed um, and said to them, oh, I, I thought that you said you were trans. How come you're not on hormones or how come you haven't had surgery? Not an appropriate question really to ask someone, but also, it doesn't mean that their journey or their feelings about their gender are any less real. So just important to remember, it doesn't always correlate with wanting further steps. And again, when we speak here about medical or surgical options, I want people to keep in mind, it's just for those who desire those steps. We're not advocating or uh, trying to have people who don't desire further steps to necessarily pursue them. So people coming through my door as a, as a hormone provider are already usually at that point. Next slide, please. Okay, so technically, this diagnosis of gender dysphoria, when you look at the diagnostic criteria, is a presence of a minimum of six months, which always makes me smile, because the reality is when people come through my clinic, it's been way longer than that but a minimum of six months. And the required piece is the very definition, of course, so the incongruence between the gender they know themselves to be and that that was assigned to them. And that this is now leading, the dysphoria piece, now leading to distress. It's affecting the individual socially, maybe at school, at work, another important area of their life. And generally speaking, this need to do away with their biological sex features um, that they were born with or that they're going through those changes of an undesired puberty, wanting other changes instead that belong to another gender, and usually a need for society to treat them as such as well. Next slide, please. Okay. So some of the controversies that come up when we talk about the diagnosis is currently this diagnosis, gender dysphoria, exists in something called the DSM. This is a manual that mental health providers use, and it literally stands for Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders. So of course, one of the big concerns is, well, are we saying this is a mental disorder? Um, and the ICD, which is a way that healthcare providers use, for example, for billing, it's how we classify diseases, is actually considering calling this, first of all, gender incongruence rather than dysphoria and putting it under a separate category also remains controversial because that category is sexual health and is this necessarily a sexual health issue, but it's hoped that that would be less stigmatizing. And it's also going to replace with the new version, this was a, a big part of the last set of meetings, um, to try to replace required distress with discomfort. It's like, what if someone's in a supportive environment and they desire gender transition and they're not overtly depressed about it? Does that mean they don't have gender dysphoria? So sort of taking some of the stigma and some of those requirements um, off the table. Next slide, please. 
Okay. The other big question I get asked is from parents of a very young child. Um, I recently had a five-year-old who was born male um, and just wears stresses, refuses to stand, to urinate, wants to be called with a female name and pronouns. And so what do we offer such a young child? So it's interesting that some of the studies show that for pre-pubertal children, it is not necessary that they're going to continue to persist with that dysphoria into teenage years. And so it's a big shift between those that continue to feel this way once puberty starts versus those that only felt that way in their early childhood. So in the early childhood years, support and love them, let them express themselves, but nothing further is to be done. It might persist, it might not. Interestingly, the statistics change quite a bit if this is persistent after the start of puberty and into puberty. Greater than 95% of those teens will continue to persist to feel dysphoric. And although it's distinct phenomenon, sometimes I get asked, well, so this very same family, the example that I gave you asked me, so doc, you're telling us that you can't say if our child is going to want to be a girl, a female, a woman later on in life, or decide that they want to go back to being a boy, but what are the odds that my kid's going to be a gay male? And again, I always say that statistics are statistics. Each case is different. Love and support your child and see what's going to happen. But the data does show that about two thirds of those that we call it desisting, it's a terrible medical term, but who decide, well, you know, I'm actually okay with my body. I don't necessarily want to change my body with hormones or surgeries or even live um, as a female in this example. Um, I had a patient explain it to me as, I've made peace with the fact that I'm an effeminate male and that I'm attracted to men, but I don't want to actually change my body. So about two thirds of those that decide that they're now going to live with the gender at birth um, do identify in the LGB groups. And one third um, will identify as being straight, not in the LGB groups, but it's two thirds, one third. It's not 95% or 5%. So I certainly can't um, give that to parents who are wondering as statistical evidence of what's going to happen in the future. Next slide, please. Okay, so what causes gender dysphoria? Other big question I get asked. So, well, why is this happening? Why does my kid feel this way? Um, why does my child want this? There are many theories. The gene is gaining popularity based on a lot of studies that we're um, now looking into. There's also the theory of hormonal exposure um, during pregnancy. So if you were born in a milieu that was mostly testosterone versus estrogen, does that now affect your gender identity? People are looking into that. There's also a whole field of epigenetics where you weren't born with that gene, but how the environment then affected the genes sort of that you have, that is why that might be a reason. There's also theory about um, nature versus nurture. How much of that is social environment? How much of that uh, affects things? The overall current thought by most experts is that it's a complex interplay. As you can imagine, the social environment, while most of us don't think it's the cause, it might influence when you felt comfortable expressing that, how you express that, who you shared it with. So that it's a complex interplay of exactly when that, that uh, rises and how it proceeds. Why the gene study? Why, why are we really looking into that? There are MRI studies that have shown that certain parts of your brain that are dimorphic, so they're different in uh, cisgender men and cisgender women, those areas when examined in patients who were transitioning with gender were, even before they started hormones, mind you, were of the size of their true gender, their firm gender, rather than biology. So is there a gene that lies outside of X and Y that then has something to do with your gender identity, how you feel about yourself? So that's been very interesting with those brain MRI studies. There are also twin studies that suggest there's a higher prevalence in monozygotic, meaning identical twins. So identical twin studies are probably pretty good evidence when we're looking at genetic correlation. And so if the incidence is higher in those identical twins, could there be a gene that we have yet to discover? Some studies looking at 
estrogen receptors, testosterone receptors, again, sort of along those interplay of hormones. Um, there's a higher incidence that we know of, of autism and eating disorders, and people are studying those genes and genes next to them. Could there be a correlation? Overall, though, I can't say with surety for you. There's still the argument of nature versus nurture. Um, we know from those variations of sex development that I alluded to that there is a somewhat of a role with the receptors, so the hormone receptors. Um, so could those hormone levels and receptors really play a role? We're still investigating. Next slide, please. Some history, and this is this one little slide is a huge disservice to the very long and prolific history um, of the process. But briefly, when people say like, this seems to be something new, you know, in the past year in the media, this seems to be something new. Well, there actually have been gender diverse and also intersex folks for many centuries. If you look back at Native American history, they have long described two-spirited people. If you look at um, the old caves and drawings, there are drawings of people with genitals of both genders. Um, in the 1800s, unfortunately, Western society clumped all of it together as homosexuality. So it didn't differentiate between people who didn't feel like the gender they knew themselves to be wasn't the same at birth, separate from orientation. And as I've discussed, they're separate concepts. But back then it was lumped together and stayed there for quite some time. Um, in 1923, not that I'm agreeing with this term, but I guess it was the first realization that, oh, that's a separate process. The term transsexual was first used to differentiate that from those people who had uh, more of an orientation aspect, but not necessarily a gender uh, diversity aspect. It wasn't until the 1930s that testosterone estrogen became more readily available and providers have used um, that, not formally, but um, have used testosterone estrogen for gender transition since it's really become available. Surgeries began around that time too in the 1930s started the known surgery started with uh, Dora Richter and that was Dr. Hirschfeld who did that surgery. There have been many more, many beautiful examples since then, um, many sad examples since then because there were unexpected complications in those early years. Um, but that's really when the whole process began more formally. In 1979, um, the WPAC organization put out its first set of official guidelines, and that stands for World Professional Association of Transgender Health. So in 1995, we're talking about kids and options for younger teenagers, Luprolite was offered. So this initially was started for children who happened to go through early puberty. You know, um, let's say a six-year-old cisgender girl has breast development, and if it isn't slowed down with medication, she might have had her period at seven and a half, eight, and mentally was not ready, of course, for those um, changes, physically wasn't ready to handle those changes. So people started to look at medications to slow down that pubertal process. And then it started to be used as an option for gender dysphoria. And that was first officially mentioned in the 2009 Endocrine Society Guidelines. Next slide, please. Certainly, there's a trend for more teenagers seeking medical options. Um, for example, in 2007, I remember attending Dr. Spack's talk um, around 2009, and he had presented his uh, data back then about how this growth has happened for his clinic. So before they put out that they have a clinic, Right. So it wasn't until about 2006 that they advertised that, oh, we have a clinic that helps uh, gender transitioning youth. They had a total. And this is a period from when they started in the late 90s all the way to 2006, a total of 40 patients in a two year span. Simply when they just came out and said, we have a clinic, we offer medical options. They had 57 in that two year span. So they went from having four referrals a year to 19 per year in that short span. There's no question, there's more awareness and there's more talk between teens. There's more awareness now with the internet, there's more communication, more information. To give you a sense at Connecticut Children's, we get between one to five new patient referrals a week. So we're also seeing a trend at our institution similar to that described in other institutions and nobody fully understands why we're seeing this piece, but more people uh, born female transitioning to male, so affirmed male gender versus the other also an overall increase, and that I think is awareness of individuals that are identifying non-binary outside of those two binary options. Next slide, please. Okay, so what would happen if we did not 
treat. When I say treat though, to take a step back, as I mentioned for those pre-pubertal younger kids, treatment is just social transition, support of their community, of their schools, their parents, perhaps a mental health provider. That's the only aspect that we're talking about before the start of puberty. I've had a couple of families ask if they can prevent puberty from happening because they had a kid present very early in their firm gender. There really isn't anything to do, medically speaking, until the start of puberty. For youth starting puberty or, or in the early stages of puberty, perhaps, this is a term that is used in lay press as a puberty blocker. More accurately, it's more of a puberty pauser. But this category of medicine, also called GnRH agonist, is an option to literally reversibly pause the undesired puberty. For those that, and as I mentioned, as puberty progresses, they may certainly persist. For those in late puberty now, estrogen or testosterone, also commonly called cross hormones, are an option. If, and again, big if, nobody's saying this needs to happen, but if physical transition is desired, the risk of then not treating them, not giving them those options, is worsening distress, depression, anxiety, and sadly, self-harm behaviors and suicide attempts. So it's, it's a true mental health crisis in some ways when you have someone who's asking for these steps, wanting these steps, feeling affirmed for a long time in these steps, who has the support um, and understands the risks and benefits and wants it and doesn't have that option given to them. Next slide, please. Okay. Um, so there are other risks too. So for example, if you did not transition earlier and you transitioned later in life, there might be some surgeries that might be more invasive. Um, for example, if someone was born female and transitioned to male, um, and none of this happened for them until much later in life, the degree of breast surgery, chest surgery that they would need might be more extensive. Um, I've often had patients ask me in the affirmed female direction that, you know, is there some way to make my voice, my vocal cords go back to being high sounding rather than the deep voice that I have? Um, is there some way of reversing the cartilage, the Adam's apple that I have? And um, you know, those need surgeries and with vocal cords, some of them are not reversible. So some of these changes would need more um, invasive methods um, if they were not treated at younger years. Next slide, please. Of course, everything has risks and benefits, and we always have a detailed discussion of both. So there are some risks, certainly, of very early treatment. Um, male to female surgery, so the creation of a vagina, current techniques use scrotal tissue to make the vagina. So you're using male genitalia, fully formed male genitalia, to make a vagina. If you block that at an early age and you didn't let that scrotum, the, the testicles, um, grow, and you don't have that tissue, that can be a tricky surgery. People are looking, though, at different ways, different types of tissue they can use, um, including colon tissue that they could use to do that surgery. But that surgery can be harder uh, in people who had that paused early in life. Fertility preservation is the big area of study. And certainly, if you pause someone in very early puberty, you didn't let their eggs or their sperm mature. And so let's say that same teenager now goes straight from that blocker to estrogen or testosterone, you've really taken away the opportunity to mature within their body their sperm or eggs. People are now looking at technologies to do this type of maturation outside of the body and then give it back to the person. This um, data is mostly coming to us from the cancer um, population. So kids who are going to go through cancer treatment that's going to render them infertile, people are saying, well, what if we took out some ovarian or testicular tissue and in the lab tried to mature it? Is that an option? So people are definitely studying it, but I always tell my families, this is experimental. So the realization that this can affect your long-term fertility options is something important to keep in mind. Um, there's of course the ethical concern of, we're asking a lot of these young people in terms of informed consent. Do you understand what it means to lose that biological fertility? Do you understand all the side effects that we're talking about? And there are some ethical concerns um, of doing it young. Next slide, please. But here's the catch. The mental health data is overwhelmingly um, supportive of undergoing transition 
if, again, if the youth desires it, because no question, there's a higher incidence of physical, sexual, emotional abuse, there's higher bullying and peer victimization. So that social support is so important. And the attempted suicide rates in those who desire medical transition and not getting it is as high as 20% versus the general population. Um, I'm going to venture it's more than 2%, sadly, due to COVID. We're seeing a mental health crisis um, around the, the world uh, with teenagers, but still nowhere near 20%. Piece of good news, wanted to end with one piece of good news there on that slide, and that is that family support is a protective factor. They found markedly decreased rates of depression, markedly improved quality of life markers in surveys where the teen said, I have good family support. I do have people who care about me, who allow me to be my true self. Next slide, please. Okay, so, so conversely, one time, sometimes I get this argument like, why are you insisting that I see a mental health provider or a therapist? They don't ask adult people who gender transition, why is it different? Why are the guidelines different for teenagers? Why do you think I should see someone? You're the first person who said to me that this is not a mental disease or a disorder, so why do I need to see anybody? And the reason why the WPATH and other organizations um, recommend this is first thing as a pediatrician I always like to say, and I remind my adult colleagues of this, is that children or teens aren't many adults. They're still growing, they're developing, they have a lot to deal with in the world today, and you're adding their body changes to this, navigating school, family, social events. And so it can be very useful to have that piece of support in addition to, of course, their family and environment, um, to have that venue for them to discuss things and to have that support. The incidents, as I mentioned before, of depression and anxiety are higher in these teens, and so they can treat them uh, and help with that as well as a separate issue. I always tell families that going on hormones is not a replacement for your antidepressant or anxiety meds by far. So you need that support and continued treatment. Um, a therapist can help with family and social functioning, education, um, assisting with how to work with the school. I had um, a therapist share with me that they wrote a, they helped the teen write a letter to the principal about how they were coming out and how they wanted that shared with the teacher. So with so many, so many things, they can uh, really help them. And then yes, um, for therapies such as hormones and surgeries, and oftentimes it's an insurance requirement as well, um, the therapist can provide this. Next slide, please. Many organizations support this. So the other, um, I think, myth about gender clinics is that there are these little groups of people out there uh, who decided that it was a good thing to provide medical options and actually multiple associations are in support, not just the uh, World Professional Association of Transgender Health, as you might expect, but the American Medical Association, the American Psychological Association, the Endocrine Society, Archives of Pediatric and Adolescent Medicines, and more. These are just some examples. Next slide, please. And official guidelines exist. Sometimes parents and referring providers, pediatricians, for example, or mental health providers may say, well, where can we find the, the published guidelines? And it's actually free on Google. If you were to go to Endocrine Society Guidelines, they used to be called of transsexual persons when they first came out. Now they're called uh, Endocrine Treatment of Gender Dysphoric, Gender Incongruent Persons. You don't have to type all of that. Do Endocrine Society Gender, and the guidelines pop up and they're free. There's also the WPATH version, which is actually right now now, the standards of care, the SOC are being updated right now. Um, they had a period of public um, uh, input, they, which they took in, and they're going to be published soon. Next slide, please. So um, another source, of course, uh, at Connecticut Children's, if you do www.connecticutchildrens.org forward slash the word gender, there's lots of resources. If, you're, if someone's looking for a therapist, if someone's trying to see, well, does my therapist meet WPATH guidelines? There's a checklist. It's asking if the therapist has worked with gender dysphoric people. Have therapists work with teenagers? Um, do they know how to make the diagnosis? There's a little checklist there. If you're looking for a support group, um, there's some listed there. Um, just more information. The Human Rights Campaign has a lot of great information as well. For school, how do you come out in school? What do you do in school? GLSCN has some wonderful resources, and GLAD has some legal resources um, as well. Of course, there are medical websites and guidelines. The referral process, if you're looking for my clinic, like how do I tell my pediatrician to refer me? What do I expect when I go to clinic? All that stuff's at this website. Next slide, please. 
The other thing that's um, wonderful to see in general as a healthcare provider is that electronic medical records uh, are required actually if they uh, get state funding to have a way to capture someone's name and pronouns. And so when I give this talk to um, divisions, to front staff, to ER staff, to uh, all the different um, divisions that we have at Connecticut Shoulders, I remind them of this fact, always ask. Never assume, never only ask the people you think might have uh, some incongruence, ask everyone. We ask everyone at check -in list, do you have a name that you want us to call your child? It could be Michael wants to be called Mike, it could be Michael wants to be called Sarah, whatever it is, do you have a name? And then what pronouns does your child use? So we're capturing that and our electronic medical records now have places to capture that. And what's nice is that in fact, especially for our kids who are gender incongruent, it's such a sign of respect. It, it gives them so much joy to see their name come out on their progress note or the little visit summary that they leave with their letters. And so that I think has been wonderful. Next slide, please. Okay. So. Hope I'm doing okay on time there. Okay, so medical options. When are they appropriate? Um, what topics do clinics that provide them discuss? And so next slide, please. Okay, so puberty blockers, again, I like to call them puberty pausers, are technically GnRH agonists. That's the, the medical category of medications. They do come in injectable or implant form. Um, and I'll just mention, because I think there was some interest in this. How often are these injections if you do them? So luprolide is a three-month, every three-month injection. Tryptorelin is an every six-month injection. The implant, we used to say, is good for one year. We're now finding most people can keep it in for two years without a problem. I have colleagues in Texas where none of these medical options are supported by insurance. They've left it as long as five years. Um, and the surgeons are unhappy when we leave them that long because of the scar tissue. But interestingly, medically, they still work often. So they work for quite some long, a long time, the implants. Um, and this is for kids that have started puberty. You cannot offer this to someone before the start of puberty. You need to experience that first step, solidify your gender identity, see which way it's going to be sure before we would do this. Um, the puberty blocker step can be used for people who are still unsure for people who need more time, for people who know for sure that their biological gender distresses them, but they may not be sure as to all their future goals. And it's a great way to give them some time and just bring down their current hormones because it's reversible. That's important, I can't stress that enough. If you were to stop this pause button, you go back exactly where you left off in your pubertal progression. Um, and so that has been used for those conditions. I've also used it in older teenagers where other medicines haven't been enough to bring down their hormones. And so that's it's used there as well. So puberty blockers is a misnomer. We actually have a lot of different categories um, that where we use GnRH agonists. But yes, um, oftentimes we will use it to pause puberty as part of gender transition. Um, and so we do have this detailed discussion, like I alluded to with infertility, because as I said, the vast majority of kids, once they go through puberty, they're going to persist with their gender dysphoria and their now affirmed gender. And so if they're going straight from the pause button to estrogen or testosterone, it's going to affect their fertility. So we have a serious discussion about that, as well as the surgeries, as I talked about. Um, and I think I reviewed that. Yes, next slide, please. So these are expensive things. We are lucky in Connecticut that by law, December 2013, um, Connecticut-based insurances. If you have insurance out of state and you're living in Connecticut, that's when uh, I have to face a lot of prior authorization business with insurance companies and they know me well. But these are otherwise very expensive out of pocket and this is a problem. Um, and so it's good that most insurances, at least in Connecticut, do cover it. But otherwise, we're talking thousands of dollars. Oh, I need to uh, update that. That's between five to 10 grand for the implant now instead of 3,000 to 8,000. So pretty pricey stuff. Injection site issues, what do I mean by that? Pain, it's a shot. Um, sometimes kids have low tolerance for pain. Sometimes they don't. So there is, we always say, could feel a little pinch, could have a little soreness. 
Uh, an allergic reaction is always possible, like any medicine. So if you have a rash, we switch the formulation to the other. Sometimes people can have headaches or hot flashes. Hot flashes, important to remember, those are usually older teenagers or late in puberty. When we're talking about early puberty, there isn't enough hormone to bring down to really cause hot flashes, but technically it's possible. You can actually have a rise in your hormones before you have a suppression. So I like to warn kids, you might have an acne flare up, or if you already started your periods, you might have an extra period before they stop. Um, the bone health issue is this. A few years of pausing puberty does not disintegrate bone. We've used these pause medicines for a long time in kids who have early puberty. And we know from those populations, you stop the blocker, your puberty progresses where you left off, and so does your bone density. So as long as you're good with your calcium and vitamin D and weight-bearing exercise, which I tell all my teens, um, your bone should be in good shape. This comes up, though, if someone wants to be in a blocker for life. So here and there, I'll have a patient. I had a patient who identified as a gender who said, can I just be, I don't want either hormone, Dr. Fulwani. I don't want estrogen or testosterone in my body. I just want to have it all blocked. And we have a difficult discussion that a few years while we're trying to figure out our goals is fine, but two to four years at that point, we're really stretching it. We've got to make a decision. We have to either let a little bit of estrogen or a little bit of testosterone back into our lives to protect our bone. So yes, it impacts bone, but the reality is the way that we're practicing it and discussing it and following it, it's unlikely. All right, the benefits, the mental health benefits. So we're halting an undesired puberty. Um, the biggest questions I get asked is if they're already menstruating is how soon can my period stop? Every time I have a period, it causes dysphoria. It's my body betraying me. I really need to stop this. In the other direction I get, how soon can these erections stop? I don't like having them in the morning. They remind me of a body I wasn't meant to have. And so yes, these medications will pause that certainly. And I talked about recovery, should they want to stop it? Um, about three months, hormone levels are back and sperm are ovulation. So periods and ovulation, sperm production, about six to 12 months and it's back. Next slide, please. Okay, so cross hormones as they're called, it refers to estrogen or testosterone. Previous guidelines, the 2009 ones said 16 and up, no exceptions. Now then we started using blockers. So we were blocking kids say, at 10, 11, 12, and then we would have them have to wait till 16 now for estrogen or testosterone. So for the 2017 guidelines, they said on a case-by-case -case basis, such as the case I just described, you might make exceptions for the 14 to 16 age group. So that if you, and again, that goes back to bone health. So I'm glad they did this because it would make me very nervous if I had somebody on a blocker for five, six years without estrogen or testosterone. That's when we were seeing the bone issue. So there's a medical piece behind this, not just, of course, a mental health piece. You know, your friends are going through puberty and your height has slowed down, not stopped, but slowed down. You're not going through puberty, your peers are. So certainly a mental health aspect to it, but also um, medical health issues with stopping someone for this period of time. So I, I think it's been an improvement. Next slide, please. So yes, we need, I need the therapist letter in my clinic. Yes, I need that someone's really spent time with you, solidified that diagnosis. And when I'm meeting with the family, I need to get that feeling and that understanding that they have a good understanding. So do you understand which of these things would be reversible? Which of these aspects would be irreversible? Because when we're talking about cross hormones, there are certain changes that are going to happen that are going to be irreversible. And that informed consent, so the patient's able to reflect that back and say, I understand this. The legal guardian guardians are uh, part of this and they understand it. We've had that discussion about fertility. Uh, you know, the honest truth is if you have born sperm, it's easier to do. Sperm banking is about 200 bucks a year to keep your sperm frozen. Egg preservation is a whole different process, super expensive and invasive shots to ovulate, uh, intravaginal ultrasounds um, to procure the eggs. So the reality is it is much harder in that direction. Testosterone over time can cause cysts on the ovaries. Um, it's not very common for the cysts to grow or be painful, but certainly there might be small cysts in the ovaries over time. And estrogen over time can actually cause testicles to shrink a bit. So they're actually impacting that testicular tissue and fertility. And as I said before, they can impact surgical options. Next slide, please. So we also talk about weight gain. 
Um, it's not common to have huge amounts of weight gain, but some people do. And so we talk about healthy diet and exercise, your cardiovascular risk factors. We're going to need monitoring. It is going to be a process with blood work, um, with visits. And if they're truly at risk for osteoporosis, I might get a bone density scan. The important thing uh, when I'm having these discussions with teenagers is realistic expectations. So between 95 to 98% of teens who gender transition will say, I'm happy I did this. I don't regret this. I'm happy I did this. Um, I'm satisfied with the changes I'm seeing. In my experience, the ones that aren't usually, it's because either it's an unrealistic expectation of the final product of what their body is going to look like or the tempo of change. They thought it was going to be quick. And I like to remind them it is a process. We're mimicking your desired puberty while stopping the undesired one. This is going to take time. And if they're realistic, they usually do very well. Next slide, please. What are the risks of testosterone? We always do a pregnancy test. Legally, we have to. And also, I remind my teenagers, we spent this whole time talking about fertility and do you want to preserve your eggs and how it can decrease your fertility, but it's not 100% and it's not immediate. So you can get pregnant while you're on testosterone and you do not want to get pregnant while you're on testosterone. So I've had a few scares, um, but fortunately none panned out in my clinic, but I like to remind them like any other teenager, I have conversations about STD prevention, pregnancy prevention, and that's important. The good news is, and I get asked this a lot, I'm adding to testosterone to ovaries and, and to a uterus. How is that going to affect their cancer risk? So far, it's not higher than the regular, the general population. So when you look at general population, cis women, cis men, trans women, trans men, cancer risk is not higher. So again, even if you weren't gender transitioning, what's your family history? Do you have a genetic mutation? What age do you need to start screening? Pap smears are now recommended at 21 and up. If you identify as a male to go have a pap smear in a female OBGYN office, it's very difficult emotionally. So we have these tough conversations about cancer screening and guidelines. And I have a nice group of um, gender diversity, transitioning friendly providers um, that I like to refer to who are sensitive to these issues. Testosterone can cause a rise in hemoglobin levels. Um, and when that happens, we do talk about, well, what else could be causing it? Nicotine use is another one. So we always talk about that. And then the Endocrine Society guidelines actually removed monitoring of the liver. We used to worry about the liver with testosterone. Back in the day, we used to use oral testosterone a lot. And that's when it was really uh, an issue. And we don't use that anymore. So we're not really seeing that. Other things with the cardiometabolic, depending on how much weight you gain, what's your diet and exercise regimen like, high blood pressure, high cholesterol, acne, if you're going through a second puberty, acne is possible, mild mood changes. The way I like to describe this to parents is, do you remember how it was for your teenager the first time through puberty? They were a little <laughs> moody. So if you're sorry, I'm inducing a second puberty, uh, mild moodiness may happen. But another question I could ask is, what about overt anger on testosterone? What about huge episodic depression or bipolar or schizoaffective? Good question, because when you look at the package, insert angers in there, because when people abuse testosterone for weight building, weightlifters, for example, they, I had a patient, I remember as a fellow in the emergency room with steroid rage, very angry. Um, the police had to hold him down. So yes, if you abuse it, yes, anger is possible. It's a steroid. And so when it's abused, we can see severe mood changes. But at the regimens that we're using, the physiologic ones, mild moodiness is what we see. Male pattern hair loss, sorry if you have the gene, and I'm you know, welcome to being male if it runs in your family, male pattern hair loss is a possibility, yep. Good news is the studies looking at actual heart attack events, despite this mild you know, increase in blood pressure and cholesterol, they did not find a higher incidence of actual heart attacks in transgender men versus cisgender men. So welcome to being male. Your risk is higher than if you were born female, sure, but it's equal to that of cis men. Next slide, please. Okay. Estrogen risks extensively been reviewed. We have a lot of data from the women's health studies looking at oral estrogen and clots and stroke. And similarly, when that was studied in transgender women, those transitioning to the femme, there's a higher incidence, no question. The incidence when you look at other forms of estrogen, fortunately, was far less. So when I talk to teenagers about types of estrogen, I say, you know, I'm really not comfortable doing high dose oral estrogen. I would love to have you on a patch or injection to really minimize those risks. Um, and that is what they showed in other populations too, whether I'm in my 
uh, variations in sex development and I have a cisgender female who was born without ovaries and I'm putting on estrogen, same concept. I really don't want you going on oral. Let's talk about other modalities and that's similar here. Whether we're talking about testosterone or estrogen, I would like to emphasize that the benefits to mental health have to be weighed against all of these risks that I'm describing. That is always part of this discussion. Next slide, please. The other thing that I'm getting asked increasingly is what is this word I'm hearing about um, online about something called detransition? So when people say detransition, they're talking about someone who's gone through transition and now wants to go back to the gender that was assigned at birth. First of all, when they say that, what is it that they mean by transition? So the, the rates of deciding you want to go back to the gender at birth are going to be higher for those who just had some social steps or who might've been on a blocker with the intent of gaining some more time to understand their future goals. Um, or I'm seeing some patients who are just being honest with me about, you know, doc, I don't intend to be on testosterone for life. I want to be on testosterone so that I can get my chest surgery because I know insurance companies want that. I want testosterone because I want a deeper voice, but I'm okay with having my periods or I'm okay with having something like an IUD or even a uterus surgery to get rid of the period aspect and then just get off hormones because I've achieved all my goals. So if their intent was never to be on cross hormones for life, I don't think it's fair to put them in the category of detransitioners who you know, went through the full transition with the intent of having it for life and then transition back. So really careful as you read articles or studies or data to understand what are they defining as transition is, and what are they defining as detransition and did they follow them out? And the real question is, do they regret it? So do you regret having undergone surgery or having undergone hormones? And in the case of hormones, if you stopped, do you ever plan to go back to it on the future? Did you achieve what you were looking for on it? Those are, I think, the more important questions to ask. Next slide, please. Um, and then when you look at that data, I think it's important to keep in mind that it's not that many. So when they looked, so there was a UK study of over 3,000 um, gender clinic attendees that found out about 0.5% when asked said, I actually regret um, undergoing um, transition. And there are even fewer that actually stayed off transition um, options. In the US, we have a study of 28,000 patients who reported 8%, and again, how they define detransition, 8% had some form at some point of something called detransition. But when you looked into that 8%, only 62% stopped temporarily. So again, that's the important thing to look at. Um, and then when you look at, and this is why I have that fertility discussion with those younger teens going on puberty blockers, when you looked at teens that went on puberty blockers and looked at how many of them will persist with their gender dysphoria because now they're into puberty and further along and older, and the Netherlands, um, and the Netherlands has excellent data because they have huge central data, um, only 2% um, decided that they want to stop everything and they want to go back to their gender at birth and didn't want to transition. Next slide, please. What do we discuss at gender clinic? This is kind of my way of addressing the myths around this, honestly. So I've um, had people make accusations or comments about, oh, you just go to this clinic and it's ridiculous. They're just prescribing hormones for just anybody who comes in for any reason. And we have an extensive discussion, I promise. I talk about how important it is to have that mental health support, family support. We do need parental uh, consent in Connecticut. Um, we talk about fertility. We talk about bones, especially if they want to stay on a blocker for more than two years. I talk to all teens, regardless of diagnosis, whether they're coming to me for a thyroid condition or what have you, are you getting enough calcium and vitamin D? 70% of teens are D deficient in Connecticut. We talk about eating healthy, staying active, cardiometabolic health. We talk about side effects, like I alluded to with oral estrogen and blood clots and stroke. We talk very importantly about which of these changes are permanent and which of these, if you were to stop cross hormones, which of these would reverse? So if you went on testosterone and have a deep voice and now said to me, well, I wanna stop and I wanna have all of the biology that I had before I started testosterone, the vocal cord deepening is permanent. If you had breast growth on estrogen and now you decided, well, and again, it's very rare, less than 1%, but if you decided that's not for me, you would need surgery um, to reverse that. So certain things are reversible, we talk about that. We talk about which things would reverse. Quitting nicotine, absolutely. 
uh, vaping and nicotine or smoking, it doesn't matter what form, quitting nicotine is super important. Um, and then, as I said, I when I talk to families, I do tell them, like I discussed here today, it's possible, it's rare, but it's possible that this teen may decide this is not for them or that social transition was enough. And so I think that that's very important to know that in these clinics, we have these detailed discussions. Next slide, please. And so my hope is with uh, my slides today and my speaking about the cases and experiences I've had, that we all have a better understanding of terminology, of course, including what is gender dysphoria, how that diagnosis is made, when is this not a phase or a trend, that consistent, insistent, persistent realization in that nature? When is it more likely to persist versus change their mind? And that persistence is far more likely to happen after we're into puberty than before the start of puberty. How a mental health provider might help guide um, youth through this? And then what are the risks of not treating the huge, unfortunate decline in mental health for those who want to pursue it and then don't get it? Um, and then there are, of course, like everything, there are risks and benefits. So the risks of treating super early in puberty are the effects on fertility, possibly bone, especially if they want to be on blockers long term and limiting certain types of surgery options, benefits of treating at younger ages when it's again, when it's affirmed and they have that support is improvement in mental health, stopping the irreversible undesired puberty changes, certain surgeries may not need to be as invasive. And then we always so that you know, have an at-length conversation about these risks and benefits before prescriptions are written. Next slide, please. Oh, yep. And my last slide was just thank you and any questions. So that's good. Thank you, Dr. Priya Fulani. That was such a comprehensive overview. It's almost like a masterclass in everything you need to know, but we're afraid to ask. But I bet there are people who might have some questions that weren't answered. Look on your screen, there's a Q&A box, put your questions there, and I promise we'll get to some questions, plus ones that were submitted in advance. But before we get to that, I wanna introduce Dr. Christopher Hughes, who is also a doctor, he is a surgeon at Connecticut Children's Medical Center. And Dr. Hughes, welcome. Thanks very much, Don. Thanks everybody for <clears throat> having me here tonight. Um, I'm gonna present a very specialized view of this topic from the surgical standpoint. I'm used to giving uh, talks uh, to a very surgical audience. And so when I talked to my wife about the talk and, and suggested that I'll just show a bunch of pictures of operations and very detailed descriptions of what I do, she thought that might not be the best idea. Um, and she's, she's usually right about most things. So I listen to her and I'll, I'll skip a lot of the details of specifically what I do in the operating room with respect to trans health, but I'll kind of try to give a, an overview of a perspective from the surgical side of things um, and, and in concert with what Dr. Fawani already mentioned. Uh, I run a, uh, a pediatric plastic surgery practice at Connecticut Children's. We uh, see the full spectrum of uh, pediatric and adolescent plastic surgical care. Uh, we do a lot of cleft and craniofacial work, but also certainly a lot of adolescent breast uh, work, and we are seeing a transgender patients in our clinic as well. We are benefited from being part of this network and being uh, part of Dr. Fawani's team. Uh, so often, uh, a lot of the things that she talked about as prerequisites and uh, parts of this multidisciplinary approach to transgender and uh, non-binary healthcare have already been established by the time that the patients come to see me, which is uh, quite nice and quite different from my experience and my training in other places in the country. Uh, next slide, please. These statistics have already been laid out for you, but um, more and more organizations are starting to uh, understand the scope and scale of the um, situation with trans health in schools. And so I think this is really a great opportunity for us in this particular environment to talk about this topic tonight. Um, from the CDC, the MMWR a couple of years ago suggested that almost 2% of high school students identify as transgender. And you can see from the other uh, graphics in the picture that most of them don't feel safe at school all the time. And that's a real opportunity for improvement for us, both as healthcare providers, but also as parents and community members to be able to address some of these glaring issues and uh, inconsistencies with the way the kids are treated at school. 
not just 2% of high school students uh, identify as transgender, but people suggest that about 0.6% of the world's population identifies as transgender or non-binary. So the rough back of the napkin math is 0.6% of 5 billion people is about 30 million people in the world identify as transgender. And that, that is very uh, well in comparison to people who are thought to be living with HIV and AIDS at around 50 million. Uh, so just to put that in perspective, not that the two are equivalent, but that the magnitude of the scale is uh, significant. Next slide, please. And when this is broken down by age group, at least in this particular country, the thought uh, among teenagers, 13 to 17, about 0.7% of the population identifies as transgender. Next slide, please. We heard a lot about the social and health disparities that a lot of our transgender youth face on a daily basis. Uh, and Dr. Kowani again did, as Dawn said, a masterclass in, in laying out the groundwork behind this. But the take home message is that these kids uh, can be in trouble and they can face uh, a much different day to day existence than people who are non transgender or non non binary will face. Um, they often report violence victimization, substance abuse, and as was mentioned, also a higher rate of suicide attempts. Next slide, please. Fortunately, this is a change landscape, if not a new landscape, and it does seem that we're able to have more productive discussions about uh, gender identity and uh, gender expression, uh, both in the medical literature and in the lay press. And that's a, that's a fairly new landscape for a lot of people, which also makes some people uncomfortable, which I'll talk about a little later. But I think this is all good news for people who have been struggling with uh, gender identity and transgender health uh, in the past, because we do have a, a new lexicon for discussion. And again, this is a great reason why we're here tonight to talk about this in the context of kids in our schools. The challenge for me as a surgeon and when we talk about interventions or ways that we start to uh, affect directly uh, teenagers or youth who identify as transgender in their gender affirmation process, when it comes to actual physical intervention, whether it's medical or other reversible forms of intervention, or surgical, which is non-reversible, uh, the choices are not necessarily as clear for a lot of parents and a lot of caregivers. Next slide, please. But we do know that kids that are part of a gender affirming care team are better. Their mental health is improved, their well being is improved, their access to pubertal suppression at the right age and in the right hands is often associated with a lower lifetime risk of suicidal ideation, which is incredible when you think about that. If you give people the opportunity to be helped, they will be. And efforts to support transgender youth uh, in, in schools uh, is also associated with an improved sense of safety. So we have, again, a real opportunity for improvement and for intervention uh, and assistance in a lot of our vulnerable teens and youth. Next slide, please. From a surgical standpoint, I don't always, I'm not always part of the picture, which is good and that's fine. Um, not all transgender patients need surgery to adequately address their feelings of dysphoria. Not all transgender patients need medical therapy to address their feelings of dysphoria. Everybody's different and everybody's uh, path to affirmation and their story is unique. But when I do get involved, it becomes much more than a simple consent form that I ask people to sign as for other certain procedures where we go through the risks and benefits of the physical intervention. In trans health and in taking care of transgender patients, I think our team from a surgical standpoint is much more a vital component within the team itself. And we adopt an individualized approach to each individual patient, which is both as our uh, governing body suggests, both ethical and necessary uh, because everybody's path is different and not uh, the procedures that I can perform with respect to gender affirmation do not fit each individual. Next slide, please. <clears throat> As was mentioned, uh, fortunately, we do have a standards of care that's been around since 1979 that's set forth uh, by the WPATH organization. This addresses both medical, um, behavioral health, and surgical care. And it uh, essentially establishes what should be done uh, based on consensus statements across the care of uh, transgender healthcare. And I, 
bring this up to all my patients when we talk. I ask them if they've ever heard of WPATH, if they know about the standards of care. And I, I do send them to the website to look around and to investigate things, not just from a technical standpoint, but to understand what the uh, organizations are doing with respect to establishing safe and effective care from a surgical standpoint for transgender patients. Um, next slide, please. For gender affirmation surgery, which is again where I come in, there are a menu, a myriad of options that are available. Um, everything from chest surgery to facial surgery to genital surgery. And again, I'm not gonna go into all the details of the specific procedures tonight because not each one is particularly important for each patient, but just to know that there are a lot of different interventions that can be done from a surgical standpoint to address each patient's specific area of dysphoria. Next slide, please. Surgery is, although not required, often an integral part of therapy for transgender patients, and particularly with respect to breast or chest reconstruction, which is also known as top surgery. That's the most common surgical intervention that most transgender patients, if they are going to have a surgical intervention, will do. And so that's often the one that I do the most, especially here at the Children's Hospital. Um, and when we talk about breast or chest surgery, if it's a transgender affirming male, then it's a mastectomy uh, with or without nipple grafting. If it's a transgender affirming female, then it's usually a form of breast augmentation, which is very similar to uh, the cosmetic breast augmentation that's done for non-transgender patients. Facial surgery is also an option for a lot of people who have dysphoria with respect to their facial appearance. And there are ways to make the facial appearance more feminine appearing or more masculine appearing, depending on the source of your dysphoria. Uh, we don't see that often in the youth and adolescent uh, realm because of growth concerns and the uh, age of development of the bony architecture of the face. But certainly in the late teenage years, uh, we do start to see that up through the adult side, um, which I see through the Hartford Healthcare component of my practice. And then genital surgery is uh, often sort of, uh, people talk about this in like hushed tones in the operating room, oh, are they gonna get bottom surgery? Are they gonna do that? Um, and it's, uh, there are many, many options with respect to genital surgery and what's called um, bottom surgery in the, the lay literature. Um, this is a fairly uh, more detailed procedure and approach. There, there are lots of different options as Dr. Fulwani mentioned. And often this requires not just a multidisciplinary gender affirming care team, but lots of surgical specialists involved beyond the scope of my practice. It often involves a gynecologist, urologists, uh, as well as plastic surgeons to um, address the specific components of the dysphoric patient. Next slide, please. In general, um, our preoperative criteria for patients is, is fairly clear and, and pretty transparent. Um, it is not a, uh, you come in, you say you want, a, let's say a chest reconstruction, you get a chest reconstruction, which is what a lot of people uh, comment on in other forums. Um, there is a very well-documented and um, clear set of criteria set forth, most importantly, by our organization, by the WPATH, but also secondarily, much less importantly, by each patient's insurance company. And so there are two specific things that we look at uh, to figure out if a patient is uh, fitting these certain criteria. But mostly in general, as was said before, it's persistent and well-documented gender dysphoria. And I'm very fortunate in my position here in Hartford and through Connecticut Children's that most of the patients that come through have all of these uh, pieces in place already. So they've already been in touch with Dr. Fawani or some other gender clinic. They've also been uh, in touch with their behavioral health and mental health care provider. They have letters from family, they have letters from their therapists, and everybody is, is on board, which is unique. And I'll say that that's not the case in a lot of other cities. I did my training in Boston, and that was not the case uh, for the most part uh, for the patients that I saw there. So they have to have this well-documented uh, sense of gender dysphoria that's identifiable and directable to a certain intervention. For example, if they have dysphoria with respect to their chest, it's directable to a chest reconstruction or a top surgery. Um, any associated mental health concerns or behavioral health concerns need to be uh, well uh, controlled and 
quote unquote stable. Um, as was said before, the concept of gender dysphoria as a mental health problem is, is fundamentally flawed and, and quite scary. I had people who trained me in plastic surgery how to do these operations who were very adamant that we should not be operating on a mental disease, which was just, it blew my mind that that was, that was the, the mindset of even people practicing within the field. But the distinction between gender dysphoria and the concept of mental disease is an important one but any associated mental health or behavioral conditions need to be well controlled and addressed prior to any surgical intervention. And finally, hormone treatment, which we heard about um, from Dr. Fulwani, is uh, not necessarily a required component or an essential component prior to all gender affirming operations. Um, the standards of care have changed in the most recent iteration, but uh, for some affirmation procedures, one or two years of hormones is required. For others, it's not required at all. And some of it's age dependent. And again, the almighty insurance dependency is, is also a director of the requirements there. Next slide, please. Chest reconstruction, as I said, is, is most of what I see through our adolescent clinic at Connecticut Children's. And it's the most common gender affirming surgery that is out there and that most people seek. And so that's really what I'll focus on tonight. Um, some studies do suggest that most trans masculine patients report um, having had or have wanted to have top surgery. So while not certainly not 97%, much less than that uh, of percentage of transgender patients ultimately undergo surgery, um, trans masculine patients tend to look towards top surgery or chest reconstruction as uh, the only surgery that they'll have for the most part. We know from outcomes data and from our uh, plastic surgical literature, as well as from the mental health literature, that chest reconstruction, regardless of the way that it's done, does really go uh, far to improve chest dysphoria and self-esteem and quality of life. Next slide, please. Not to get into the nitty gritty details of what we do, but in general, for a uh, gender affirming top surgery, the, the role, this is for a transgender male, is to remove the breast tissue and to contour the chest into being more masculine appearing. And there's lots of different ways to do that. There's lots of different scar patterns. I have a long discussion with patients when they come uh, for that consultation regarding their um, concepts about scarring and, and what to expect from a post-operative standpoint. But there's some general approaches dependent on anatomy and dependent on patient preference. Um, but in general, the, the procedure removes the breast tissue. It leaves most of the skin uh, there and it uh, either leaves the nipple and areolar complex in place or it resizes it and reshapes it as a, as a skin graft. In general patients for us, they come in and go home the same day. Um, it's an outpatient procedure. Recovery time is about a week of uh, significant discomfort and then a few more weeks of uh, soreness that improves daily. Um, and most people are back to their baseline activity uh, within three weeks. Um, next slide, please. And as I said, what we know from our literature and, and things, this is changing all the time. And as more people are seeking gender affirmation surgery, we're getting more data from our own practices. And this is a recent study from a multi-center um, evaluation that looked at the post-operative outcomes associated with uh, top surgery or chest reconstruction based on a certain quality of life module that they were testing. Next slide, please. And over 100 people were part of this review. And across the board, the blue lines are bigger than the yellow lines, which essentially just means that uh, post-operative standpoint, Patients report uh, from a patient reported outcome perspective improvement in their dysphoria with respect to their chest and their body, but also importantly, from a psychological standpoint, they reported significantly improved psychological quality of life compared to preoperatively. This is not the most rigorous study that exists out there, but it is one of the uh, most comprehensive that we have. And as a way to measure our uh, interventions and metric our success with respect to addressing the problem at hand or the condition at hand. Um, over and over again, the data from the plastic surgery literature suggests that what we're doing is a good thing and that what we're doing is addressing the specific components of gender dysphoria in certain patients. Next slide, please. 
but it's a difficult thing. And we talked about the challenges of treating uh, adolescents with uh, medical interventions um, and the concept of the dividing line between normal adolescent identity development, which happens normally in adolescents, and gender identity development and the ultimate development of gender dysphoria. And I think this is where a lot of people start to question as they see more and more people coming through clinic or more and more they hear about it on the news or they hear about it from their friends that so-and-so is identifying as such and such now. People are turning a little bit defensive in some ways and thinking about, well, what's, what's just adolescence and what's gender dysphoria? And, you know, in some ways you get it, right? I think most of us who have kids just want the best for our kids and, and we're just trying to put out fires every day. And then you got this other thing to think about and, and how do you best take care of your kids and how do you best protect your children? And it can be a challenging conversation to have. It can be something for which there's not any uh, quick answer. And so um, this is a challenging population to talk about these concepts of gender dysphoria and non-reversible interventions with surgery. Um, but again, the best that we know from the data and from the multiple specialists that have inputted uh, with their outcomes assessments that uh, we are adequately addressing a lot of the dysphoric components that people present with in a sustainable and a long-term way. Next slide, please. We heard before also about the concept of gender identity and the fluidity of gender in youth. Again, that just know that most youth who identify as transgender or who raise gender uh, dysphoric um, concerns with their parents or with their families will not persist with their dysphoria into adulthood. Uh, by contrast, most adolescents that present with gender dysphoria do persist. Next slide, please. And because of certain insurance changes and because of certain uh, policies, both pro and contra around the country and around the world, um, the concept of caring for our adolescents with gender identity uh, concerns is um, gaining a lot of traction in multiple different venues, including the lay press. This is a good article from a couple of years ago from The Atlantic that discusses the choices about how to make good choices and what decisions to make uh, when you talk about intervening on your children who say that they're transgender. And more recently, next slide, please. An article in the New York Times, this is from this last month, um, talking about uh, some of the um, questions that have been raised as, again, more and more people are finding the uh, the words and the ways to describe their feelings and their condition, more and more people are seeking out care. And that means more and more data and more and more people involved in this care. And so doctors, me, our, my colleagues, Dr. Fawani, have started to critically appraise what we've taken for granted in the past and reevaluate the ways that we approach um, treatment, both from a medical and behavioral health standpoint and from a surgical standpoint. Next slide, please. And I think in general, that's, that's a good thing. Um, it's a good thing for us to critically appraise what we're doing and not just assume that because somebody says that they are transgender, that that's all that the discussion that needs to be had. Um, I think what's been reiterated multiple times tonight is that it's important to have an individualized and comprehensive approach to every individual patient because nobody's story is the same, nobody's journey is the same, and nobody's ultimate outcome is gonna be the same. But if you have a family member or a child that has some expression of gender dysphoria, getting them involved in a team that multidisciplinarily addresses a lot of the components of gender dysphoria, then you give them the best chance for not only ultimate happiness, but ultimate health. And we've seen that again with the, with the outcomes measures. But I do think it's important to have these discussions and it's important to engage in conversations with people who don't necessarily know all the background uh, literature that we know or that don't necessarily know all the words that we know to describe what's going on um, in their family members or their children's lives. And so, again, that's why I really think that this forum is, is especially important uh, both now and, and multiple times into the future. Um, this is a, uh, a book that just came out this year. I had not heard of this prior to working for this talk, but the title is very striking and the cover is very striking. Um, and it uh, is a well-written book uh, from someone who uh, has a, 
different view than I think most of us here tonight uh, on uh, trans health and uh, potential interventions for our adolescent kids. Um, some of the, the data is flawed that she presents, but some of it's not. And I think um, it's, it's always good to engage with others who have differing opinions to be able to have a meaningful conversation. Uh, because again, I think, as I said, we all just want the best thing for our kids. We want them to be safe. We want them to be happy. And I think we just differ in some ways about how we think we should address them. Next slide, please. As was mentioned before, because of all of the conversations that have been evolving as more and more people are getting um, plugged into this space, we're critically appraising what we do. Dr. Fulani mentioned the WPATH uh, recent updates. This is the draft update from the most recent version, the eighth version, which will come out in final form in the next couple of months. It was open to public comment, which I thought was a really cool uh, concept for the governing body to undertake. And, um, they have sort of updated the standards and the criteria for um, gender affirming interventions, both from a medical standpoint and the surgical standpoint uh, for the more restrictive uh, in general. Um, and that's been a source of contention too, but in general, they're taking extra steps to require more documentation and more evidence of uh, dysphoric persistence. Um, and so for me, from a surgical standpoint, they have some age criteria for different interventions. Again, where I am most involved is in chest masculinization. That's the most common procedure we do. The age range has sort of steadily dropped. Uh, now they, they suggest that 15 years is the lowest limit of uh, chest reconstruction, unless there are significant insinuating circumstances, as is the case for every uh, surgical intervention that we do. Next slide, please. And it's interesting time to be involved in trans healthcare from a provider standpoint and certainly from a parent standpoint. Um, the landscape is evolving rapidly. And, and prior to this talk, we had a, an email chain between the organizers and uh, us presenters about some new things that have come up in South Dakota just recently. And uh, this is a map from 2019, which is already extremely out of date and not even applicable anymore for uh, states within our country that are either uh, supportive of transgender health care or have specific provisions in place within their legislature to either ignore transgender health care or to restrict transgender health care. Um, and the most recent data on the left hand side of the screen comes uh, from just this year where it, they suggest that 21 states in the past legislative session have introduced bills to deny gender affirming care for youth and six states in particular have penalties for not just parents, but for healthcare providers who attempt to provide uh, gender affirming care for their children. Next slide, please. And beyond being sort of a political uh, fire stick or lightning rod um, and beyond sort of being a dividing line between people who want to have conversations about this topic, the end result of the variability in coverage and the restriction in coverage means that again, the already vulnerable populations are becoming disenfranchised and more at risk. Um, and so this is an estimate from the UCLA uh, Williams Institute from this year, uh, this past year, I guess, that suggests that about 45,000 kids as a result of this uh, most recent legislative selection will be left out of available transgender care. And so you're putting another 45,000 kids, these are, these are kids ages 13 to 18, at extreme risk for all of the things that we talked about before, just because from a legislative standpoint, we can't get out of our own way and provide reasonable coverage for trans youth. Next slide, please. And um, in contrast to the people who think of this as something to be restricted, um, we see what we see on a daily basis. And Dr. Fawani mentioned the patients that come to her clinic. Um, we all have our stories about uh, our individual interaction with the trans community from a healthcare provider standpoint. And in general, uh, anecdotes and case reports are the lowest form of evidence, but they're often the most powerful um, that we have. And um, so I reached out to a couple of my patients um, prior to this talk, just to get from their perspective, what their interaction, their experience has been um, in gender affirming surgery and their path through that. Um, this is by no means a, a, testimony, a testament to my work or to our group, 
uh, beyond to say that um, this is meaningful stuff that we're doing and we can really affect people's lives. Um, and so I'll just read this because this is too much, too many words to put on the slide. Um, but um, this is one of my uh, trans masculine patients that we performed surgery on recently. And he said that uh, ever since I began puberty at around 10, my chest was deeply distressing to me. And I wasn't sure why at first. All I knew is thinking about it disgusted me and I tried to hide it. As I grew a little older and realized that I was a boy, I knew that I wanted a double mastectomy and had been begging my parents to get it as soon as I possibly could. Getting gender affirmation surgery changed my life. It was only about six months ago, but every day is a little brighter and easier now that I don't have to think about binding or hiding my chest. When I first woke up from, woke up from top surgery, my dad tells me my first words were, I'm so happy. Since then, I continue to feel it. Being able to do small things like shower and not being afraid to look down or being able to put on a shirt without having a layer in between is simply fantastic. I can't tell you how much relief I feel knowing that I'll finally be able to swim again once the weather heats up and not miss trips to the lake due to dysphoria. I love my new chest so much. It's masculine. It makes me look like the boy I have always known that I am. And those, again, it's poor quality evidence, and it's not something that you would base clinical recommendations on. But hearing testimonials like that, it's hard to argue um, that we're not doing something meaningful for patients who are very disenfranchised and who are very vulnerable. And so, again, this is why it's a, a wonderful conversation to have tonight and a great forum to have it in. Last, next slide, please. I think this is my last one. And it's important, again, that we're doing it in the context of the schools. Um, this is some of the more recent data that's out there. Again, the same themes emerge over and over again, but transgender youth, especially within schools, almost half of them uh, reported that as teenagers in K through 12, so this is from elementary school all the way up through high school, were verbally harassed. About half of them were not allowed to dress in a way that fit their gender expression or their gender identity. About 13% of them were sexually assaulted because people thought they were transgender. You think about that, you think about the magnitude of scale of those percentages, and it's incredible. And so it's, it's a great thing that we are here tonight, um, that we have enough people here to have a good discussion and that the West Hartford school system and everyone of our supporters here has thought it important enough to help our kids and to address the vulnerable populations that exist and to do the best we can to make our kids happy and healthy. And I'm happy to be part of that and I appreciate uh, being here very much. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Hughes. Oh my goodness, that testimonial, I was holding back tears. So thank you. Um, we do have questions, only a few minutes left. So I'm gonna start with the first one for Dr. Fulani. I, I think you answered this, but let's just make sure we get it correct. Um, are the hormone suppressants shots or medication? Right, so there's a couple of different forms. There's a couple of brands like Luprolide and Triptorelin, which are injectables. Luprolide's every three months, Triptorelin's every six months, and then there's an implant, which is the other option. When you're looking at puberty pause medicines, those are the options, the GnRH agonists. Sometimes that gets confusing because in the trans femme world, so if you're feminizing, you might need pills to block the effect of testosterone. That's the only pill um, option area that I'm aware of, but that's not a true puberty suppressor. It doesn't bring down the production of your endogenous hormones the way the injections or the implants would. Um, sometimes in my, because um, I'm also an adult endocrinologist, sometimes in my older patients, we can't get them the blockers. We can't get the injections covered by insurance and we'll use the spironolactone tablets to block testosterone. And they work, but they're not as potent as the GnRH agonist. So maybe that's where the confusion comes from. But for youth, we're generally talking about, and in Connecticut, it's covered. We're talking about the injections or the implants. Yeah. Dr. Hughes, uh, uh, one of our viewers wants to know, how do you discuss gender identity without confusing neurodiverse kids? And, you know, there's a whole different way of being transgender than, you know, just nine years ago when I came out, non-binary folks, um, gender not conforming. Not everybody is just, you know, technically transsexual or transgender. So how do you um, discuss this gender identity issue without confusing? Yeah, well, it's, I'm, and I'm not perfect at it. So I'm, I'm learning also as we have these conversations, uh, which I think is important to remember um, that, you know, the, the reason that this is an interesting topic and one that is um, 
confusing uh, to some people is that uh, I don't think anybody really has all the answers for it and it's constantly evolving. So, um, but what I typically do is I have a, this is among my longer consultations uh, in the office and we have a, a thorough discussion about the uh, history that they've had so far. I go through their own personal history about um, timing of identification and uh, steps that they've taken to date to affirm their gender identity. Um, we have, um, like I said, been privileged to be part of a team that already has a lot of the, uh, for lack of a better phrase, check boxes checked before they get to us. So they've had these conversations often with their behavioral health providers or with Dr. Fawani or their pre pediatrician. Um, so they know sort of what I'm going to ask before I even ask it in a lot of ways. And so they're able to um, provide a lot of the important history with respect to their gender identity. And then I also think it's important, as I said before, that uh, there's not one solution to every person. And so, for instance, in the non-binary population, um, it's not just that they either get a mastectomy or a removal of breast tissue or they don't. You know, there are other options, um, a, a different type of a breast reduction, which is where you just make the breast tissue smaller and, and do different things, uh, maybe a particular option for non-binary folks um, rather than for uh, trans masculine folks who would prefer the mastectomy. So we have sort of those conversations about the specifics of their identity and their dysphoria if, if it persists and uh, the different surgical options that are um, available to them because there's not one size that fits all for them. Now it's eight o'clock and as Ted Koppel used to say on the old Nightline show, alert the affiliates, we're going to go over. <laughs> so um, 50 uh, participants still watching us, please stay with us because we still want to answer some more questions. Priya, did you have an answer for that question as well I, about I think, confusion? Um, I think if I'm asked, understanding the, the question correctly, it's alluding to neurodiversity, the neurodiverse kids. So there's a higher incidence of um, autism and Asperger's that has been reported. One study suggested that it's the same as any mental health clinic because there's a bias because these kids are seeing mental health professionals and therefore getting diagnosed, or is it a true link? Um, there's a recent study that showed that there's, there's a little bit of a flag there. It's a true link. Um, the incidence of autism and Asperger's is higher. So when a kid like that who has... Um, understandably, it's difficult to make sure that they're understanding everything that you're talking about and their gender identity is coming from a true place for them. It's interesting to me, but actually the theory is that they're more comfortable, not less comfortable sharing uh, that their gender identity doesn't match that of their uh, gender at birth, because that's actually a thought as to why there might be more gender dysphoria is that they're not always thinking about, well, how are my parents going to feel about that? How's my school going to feel about that? They're more comfortable just learning it out. This is who I am. And so that's interesting that uh, neurodiverse kids actually might be more forthcoming about it. In terms of understanding their goals, I've had uh, several patients where we've had to be more creative. So I've done pictures. Can you draw? You're, I know that you're not comfortable sharing that with me. Can you draw what your ideal body would be like? Can you mark on a paper? Can you write me a letter? Uh, about your journey. So there, there are creative ways to get more information. I've also worked with developmental pediatrics um, on that. So yes, neurodiversity is a, it's a challenging area. In some ways, I feel they're more forthcoming about their true selves, but in some ways, yes, teasing out the information, um, uh, you know, can be, can be trickier. All right, I have another question. They're still popping in. Thank you very much. Um, whoever wants to tackle this one, uh, this person wants to know if uh, given the many complexities of transitioning for teenagers, are teenagers typically receptive or resistant to the idea of fertility preservation? Is it something that is high uh, or maybe in the midst of the teens list of priorities? That's an excellent question. So I always have to have this conversation before I can prescribe hormones, right? So um, when I approach it as like, this is what's involved. If you're born male, this is what's involved. There's a fee for the initial sperm analysis. There's about a cost of 200 bucks per year to keep it frozen. 50-50. So on those transitioning to female, 50-50 on the teenagers who are like, yeah, that's not a big deal. I can ejaculate and provide a specimen versus those that would say even that's too too stressful. Um, doing that is too stressful. I can't do it. 50-50. In the other direction, less than 5% of my patients take me up on it. I always offer, would you like to see the fertility specialist for egg preservation? But because of the expense and the invasiveness of it, frankly, uh, not that many patients want to proceed with it. 
it's hard to know how much of that is that. So how much of the, I don't want a referral, thank you very much for asking, is the hesitation around invasiveness and cost versus had there been an easier way around that, would more of them had pursued that. Most teenagers will say, I've thought about it, I don't care, I don't want kids or I'll adopt. It's very difficult though to predict if they're gonna have regret around that when they're in their 20s or their 30s or their 40s, uh, they're still teenagers. But I would say 50-50 for sperm preservation, less than 5% for egg preservation. This one is a question I'm gonna answer. Um, and first they say, thank you. And I say thank you to both of our doctors, Fulani and Dr. Hughes. Um, Thank you for presenting on this very important topic. A question I feel frequently is, quote, why is being trans more common now than say 20 or 30 years ago? Any thoughts on this? You know, there are a lot of people who suddenly say, as Priya has said earlier, wow, people are just, you know, suddenly transing and they're coming out as trans. Well, it's just that back in the day, say 20, 30 years ago, it's hard to believe that 20 years ago was 2000. Um, there weren't really a lot of research. There wasn't YouTube. There weren't resources. There wasn't the internet even in the eighties um, when I was going through, um, you know, puberty and stuff. And we didn't have the resources, so a lot of people didn't know even what to call it. There were even people who called it transvestitism because that's all they knew was that you know some people got uh, their um, turn on by dressing in the opposite gender. But as Dr. Uh, Fulani said. For centuries, people have been presenting in the opposite gender to live their fulfillment and authentic lives. So my question would be, just because something wasn't common, does it mean it didn't exist? No. Left-handedness probably wasn't very common at a certain point, but yeah, there are left-handed people. Um, and for those people who don't understand gender dysphoria, let me just throw this at you. A activist I know, Hannah Simpson, ask people, and I'm going to ask Dr. Fulani, are you lefty or righty, Dr. Fulani? Righty. So if you wrote uh, your name and all the things you wrote all your life with your left hand, how would that look? Terrible. Worse than right. my right hand signature right now. <laughs> but imagine Dr. Hughes and I come along and say, Dr. Fulani, try writing with your right hand. You'd be like, whoa, this is how it's supposed to be. That's what gender identity really is. It's like handedness. You just know this is what it's supposed to be like. And that's what has been a real eye opener for a lot of people who are cisgender who don't get this whole, how can you not know who you are? Well, trans people know who they are, but very often society doesn't want us to come out. So here's another question. Um, let's see if Dr. Yus wants to take a, this one. How to support educators providing clubs and curriculum? What are ways to support our kids' friends who may not have an accepting family, Dr. Yus? That's a very good question. Ways to support our kids' friends who may not have an accepting family. I think, um, I mean, I don't know how to be prescriptive or, or what specific programs exist, but I think the advice that uh, Dr. Fawani gave earlier about kids who are too young to uh, undergo medical intervention and have expressed gender dysphoria early in their lives is just to, to love them and to respect them and to offer them a safe haven. You know, if we know that your child's friend, if that's what this question is about, is uh, expressing um, gender dysphoria or is identifying as transgender, we know that they're probably also getting bullied and they're probably also feeling unsafe at school and they're probably also maybe maybe not having ideas about self-harm and other um, concerns. And so probably the best thing is probably the easiest thing and just that means take care of them and, and honor them and honor that decision and make sure that at least from your standpoint, even though they're not your child, you offer them a safe haven from their day-to-day -day life. Um, yeah, and you know you don't want to get involved in other people's parenting, but I will tell you that despite the the myth, folks, that you know trans people are mentally ill, it's the lack of acceptance and it's the lack of of um, being included that causes depression. That's what causes the mental health issues. It isn't that being trans or non-binary is a mental illness. It's feeling like no one loves you or no one wants you and feeling rejected. Rejection is what causes the terrible spike in depression and in some cases, suicide ideation. Dr. Um, Fulani, I have a question for you. Can you speak a bit about, the, um, about children who first expressed gender dysphoria in late adolescence? My child appeared to progress from a very happy girly childhood to insistently identifying as male between eighth grade and sophomore year in high school. 
Yeah. So I think that a lot of us are influenced by the media stories like uh, jazz or like the, the traditional like, oh, I knew when I was and I and that's fine. That's fine. You know, and Don knew. So I, I know that a lot of people do have that uh, described gender identity formation as the psychologists and behavioral health providers and pediatricians will tell you between age four to six. But that is not everyone. So for a lot of people, there's a sense that I'm not feeling comfortable. There's a sense that something's not right. But the realization that that's actually their gender identity may truly not happen for them until puberty, because that's when it's that feeling of, wait a second, I'm not supposed to have periods. Wait a second, this part's not supposed to grow. This isn't supposed to happen. And I noticed that more in the affirmed male gender. So that because it raises fewer eyebrows, right? If a little girl wants to have a shorter haircut or wants to climb trees with her brother or doesn't want to wear a dress, she's not necessarily excluded as much from society as the little boy who now wants to wear a pink dress. So that I find that there's earlier presentation in the affirmed female gender because of a lack of societal acceptance around it versus in the affirmed male gender where, oh, it's a tomboy, it's okay. So that it's often not until the period or until breast development. I'm actually seeing a lot of patients who, uh, you know, very comfortable being girly, girly, or going back and forth between girly, tomboy. And it's not until really real breast growth or the first period start that it's that betrayal of the body, that sense of, no, 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 wait a second. This is not just a little bit uncomfortable with my body. That's one thing. The second thing I often do with my teens is I ask them in any realm, did they have that discomfort or in any realm did they present in their affirmed gender? And what I'm finding is a lot of teens in their online persona. So I know I didn't tell, I didn't know for sure until I had my first period when I was you know, 13, or I didn't tell my friends until I looked up the term trans or I had a trans friend and then it clicked for me. But then I say like, what about online stuff? Oh, I've been using Mike instead of Michelle for my online game persona since I was eight or nine. I was just like that. So it's very interesting that sometimes because it's a it's an anonymous forum or um, online seems to be for a lot of teens in this generation, a safer space to explore that. Uh, sometimes they've done online support groups or, or asked other people who are trans online before they've come out to families or friends. So um, sometimes asking them in any realm, have they presented that way and felt comfortable can be helpful? Was there any sense of discomfort? I've also had this interesting phenomenon where people will push them themselves because they feel like nobody's going to accept them if they were to go in their firm gender. Well, let me push myself to be girly, girly. Let me make sure that I fitting everybody's expectation of me. And these are usually the kids who are type A personalities. They're pushing themselves to be good in many areas. And they're going to push themselves to try not to fit their firm gender, to try to fit their biology. And when you go into it, like, when did you really first think that way? Sometimes I have that piece of the interview without the parent, the kids in tears. I've known for a long time. I just didn't think anybody would accept me. So I didn't come out or share that till I was older. So there can be many, many reasons, many, many reasons why that initial and sometimes it's just truly not not any other reason supportive family didn't know until those pubertal changes happened that wait a second I don't think I'm a girl and that's fine it doesn't make anybody's journey less relevant or less real if it happens for them later in life and that's important because we have this impression from the media that it's got to be four to six you've always if it you didn't know since you were a young kid it can't be the real thing and I think that's something we have to fight to we have to fight that perception the misperception so um, one of the nice things about being moderator is I get to ask my question of the two experts. I mentioned at the beginning that I have a uh, gender diverse child. I have a uh, third child who came out last month as gender fluid trans femme. And as you have said, both of you, it's got to be insistent, persistent, and consistent. But that's the one thing I'm having struggling with. I'm struggling as a trans woman with my child because they're 15 and they're not consistent everywhere. Certain people know, certain people don't. I guess anyone watching this tonight who knows me knows what I'm talking about now. They're okay with me telling this. I asked them first if I could talk about this. What do we do in those situations where I have to basically think in my head real quick, okay, I have to use this pronoun for this person and that name for that person and not mix it up. And also as someone who really hates it when people 
like my mother-in-law <laughs> use he and him. I hate being misgendered. I also have misgendered this child and I have to work harder at getting those pronouns right. So just for everyone out there who worries about stumbling, it happens to all of us. So what's your advice in terms of not having that third system, that consistent? Well, first, thanks for sharing that. That can't be, be easy. And it's, it's absolutely true. We all stumble and make mistakes and it's fine. We just move on. When I give this talk to, to healthcare providers, people have had negative experiences with healthcare, sometimes with trying to educate the healthcare provider because they've stumbled and then they, they panic. Um, so you just, sorry, I called you the wrong name or pronoun, move on and don't put the onus on the person to now have to forgive you and go through a process over that. So thank you for sharing that number one. The insistent, persistent, consistent doesn't necessarily mean the binary, and that's important too. If you're insistent, persistent, and consistently gender fluid, that's a thing. That, that's okay. Then that's your gender identity, and that's cool. And I'm seeing a lot of non-binary kids who are afraid to share that with me because they think I'm going to box them or not support transition or not support certain goals and not other goals because maybe they're looking for breast development but not necessarily genital changes. That's okay. Everybody's journey is unique, and that's okay. So if, if it's consistency with, well, I'm surely gender fluid, I just don't know what my long-term body goals are, that's okay. That's still a consistent gender fluid identity and that's okay. So it's, it's more that along those lines, there's persistence, insistence, and consistent. And a consistency also does not mean that I'm comfortable telling everybody or that I'm comfortable for everybody going with this name and pronoun, but there's consistency in the fluidity. There's consistency in saying today, I really feel like this. I want you to respect that. It's hard and impossible to always do that if, you're, if you raise them and you know them a certain way, right? And I always tell my teenagers, remember, this is your parents' journey too. Because oftentimes when you have them in the room and you're doing a history and physical, there's like this 10-minute sidebar where they're arguing over this. And mom, I told you it's she. Why are you doing this? Mom's like, I'm trying. So I always <laughs> remind the teenager, listen, they're transitioning with you too. Be patient with them. So that's okay, but what I'm, if I'm, correct me if I'm wrong, but I'm, I'm sensing there is consistency in the fluidity that it just might be certain realms where they want something known, certain realms where they don't want that known. And I would still consider that consistency done. Right on the nose. And let me just underscore, I love my children. I love this child. I love them no matter how they present. And yeah, it's really important because um, the things you're saying are exactly true. Um, I'd like to just live, give Dr. Hughes the final word Dr. Hughes, if not this topic, anything else you wanted to make sure our, our viewers know? I think I um, just wanted to thank everybody again for coming. And um, I think everybody has said pretty much the same thing uh, in different ways tonight, which is uh, very consistent in and of itself, but that is to treat each person uh, as an individual. And as you just said, Bria, be patient and be kind. Uh, because this is a journey. This is not an easy thing to go through for anybody involved. And uh, that takes a lot of patience. That takes a lot of honoring each individual space and each individual story. Um, and we do that in lots of different ways. Sometimes we're good at it. Sometimes we're inconsistent at it. Um, but understanding that that's okay too. You know, we're all working together for, like I said before, the same end goal, which is to make sure our kids are, are happy and that they are able to be who they know they are. Um, so I think that's, that's the key. And I'm happy that everyone was able to take part. If your question wasn't answered, or if you have other questions, we're gonna send out an email with resources and a link to watch the whole recording, should you wanna share this. I wanna thank Dr. Priya Fulwani, Dr. Christopher Hughes. Thank you so much for taking time tonight. I also wanna thank our partners, the West Hartford Human Rights Commission, West Hartford Pride, West Hartford Community of Concern, the Hartford Gay and Lesbian Health Collective, and of course, WHCI, West Hartford Community Interactive, for providing this webinar. I wish everyone safety, health, and love. Thank you very much. Good night.